Let's uh, open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this uh, beautiful day. We pray that you'll bless our time together this morning. Um, pray that uh, you will use this information, you'll, the people will find this information valuable uh, in their walk and understanding the times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today, um, I don't speak um, with a lisp or anything, and I'm hearing like uh, thunder. Oh, it's a Harley outside. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the guy. He lives down the street from. He lives around the corner from me now. That's what that noise is all the time. So I thought I lived was moving out in a nice, peaceful country. Yeah. <laughs> the. Um, so it was a very busy week for us. We're still unpacking from, we're still moving. I will, someday I will say we have moved, but that moved means we've finished. But we're still in the process, and we did a lot of, a lot of boxes this week. And I had, to, I had some things to do at the office, too, so um, it was uh, a little bit difficult to keep up this week. It was... A, a lot of things going on, I think, and I think the list of things that I won't talk about today would be far longer than what I am going to talk about. I'm going to try to keep it to a few things. Now, again, we talk each week about the convergence of events and the uh, disrupted world that we live in. And it seems that uh, this becomes truer and truer each week. It is, I think it's Safe to say it's chaotic out there. Now remember, we do put uh, my prophecy update up also at uh, Remnant Truth Network, rtntv.org. Um, we're still, I think, working out a few little bugs there, but you might want to take a look at my update there and some other teachings that are put up there as we try to communicate uh, things about the Bible and the things that are going on in our time, because we do think we live in a very important time. I also did a radio interview this week with David Fiorazzo at Stand Up For The Truth. You can find that at the stand, just Google Stand Up For The Truth podcast, and it should come up. You can also subscribe to that in iTunes. And I, I listened to all of his shows this week, and they were, all of them were very excellent. So let me just set a little bit of context for the things that I'm going to talk about. Because I think when you... If you want to get one overarching theme from this, it will come from these verses. And my title, Mything the Point, is sort of related to this passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now setting the stage for Paul writing this, remember Paul is near the time of his execution. And as I've said in the past, I did a series a long time ago called Famous Last Words of people in the Bible, Joshua, Moses, uh, I think Elijah, Paul, Jesus, that you know, when people knew that they were at the end, they were going to talk about something that was really, really important. And this is what was really on Paul's heart. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And this was a really a big theme of what Paul talked about when uh, in Acts 16 or Acts 20 when he was meeting with the Ephesian elders for the last time he warned them that even from among your own selves there will become wolves that will come after the sheep and you need to protect the flock. He talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 that there is coming a final falling away departure from the truth, departure from the faith, a rebellion, if you will. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. And then here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now this is a warning to church, the church, the called out ones. And it's, it's important to note that because if it's happening in the church, do you expect this to happen in the culture, in the world? And the answer is you better believe it's going to happen. Now my interview Friday with David on Stand Up For The Truth, we talked about do the facts really matter anymore? So I'll just share a quick story that I shared Friday in case people missed it. I've been a trial lawyer now for 40 years. When I was, and I've shared this many times, when I was a young trial lawyer, I used to go to seminars to be a better trial lawyer. And one of the things that they would teach you was that they would, they would teach you how to be a more effective presenter of the facts, how to use slides, demonstrative evidence, charts, that type of thing. And I bought into that very early in my career. We were doing, uh, I had a toxicologist I worked with a number of chemical exposure cases for a large company, and we developed slide presentations, early versions of PowerPoint, if you will, before PowerPoint even existed. We did charts. I had a grade crossing accident once. And what the person saw or could see at the intersection, if he had looked, was very important. I mean, this person had uh, quadriplegic catastrophic injuries. It was, the injuries were just horrible. But I was defending the railroad, and so what we did was I was able to, um, with some risk, with some upset of my partners, I insisted that we go all the way to the top of the railroad company, and we get the exact train, engine, and cars made up in a train and run it through that grade crossing a number of times and film it and video it. Because I thought that it was important for people to know the facts of what the person would have seen if they had looked that day. The title of my talk was, Do the Facts Really Matter Anymore? The interview that I did with David on Friday. And so at some point in my career, it changed from effective presentation of the facts to how do you appeal to people's emotions? And this, the shift started in the 1990s. It became endemic in the culture probably before that time, but it became more apparent. It now seems to be that this is what everybody runs on. Do the facts really matter? And that's sort of why I called this talk today, mything the point. Because people are insisting on just making it up or not even looking at the facts. And as someone who's in near the end of a career as a trial lawyer, it's a very troubling development because at least I've been committed to the facts all along, but it changed. And so now you have seminars on trial lawyers about how to appeal, appeal to people's emotions, how to get that emotional hick, uh, hook into them. And you'll see that in some TV shows like the TV show uh, Bull, where they look at how the people are responding in the jury and they're taking their temperatures and that type of thing to see how they're listening. And it does, by the way, it doesn't always work. I had a case where I was sure that I knew who was going to be the jury foreperson and she, I thought we had really connected during the trial, but that was probably the most shocking verdict I've ever had. It was not a good one. Uh, fortunately, we got it reduced on appeal, but um, I, I did not read her at all. <laughs> I mean, they really hammered us. And so now trial lawyers learn about how to appeal to emotions. We even take acting classes. I've taken a number of acting classes. You may not believe that. <laughs> this, is, this is the improved acting actor, John Haller. I should get my money back, huh? So let's... Uh, Boy, where to start? When we talk about mything the point, the examples in our culture and world are legion. And what's, what's happening is everybody is out there creating their own narrative. 
it is it's it's troubling so here we see in the election nancy pelosi is saying that biden shouldn't debate trump because it would it would legitimize trump in some fashion now where's that going well that's going to be they're going to regardless of how this election turns out uh, and I said this Friday, I don't know that when we get to early January, we're going to know who won this thing, unless it's just an absolute landslide for one side or the other, for one of the parties. And then there will be all sorts of things. So let's say that uh, they are able to count electoral votes when they open the electoral votes in early in, De in December. Maybe it's extended by Congress a little bit, if Congress could even get together and agree on that. They can, they can move the date a little bit by legislation. But let's say we get to early January when they open the electoral votes, they open the electoral votes and the leading party has 200, but they need 270 to win. What's gonna happen? Well then, because nobody has a majority, it goes to the House of Representatives. And they're allowed to vote one vote for each state. So it will be dependent on the makeup of the congressional delegation from each state. And they will vote who they should think should win the election. And they have to take it from the top two or three or four, depending on the, the way the Constitution reads. But the top two people that finish in the presidential election, they have to vote for one of those two people. So that would be Biden or Trump. But then what happens if the congressional elections are not decided? And so there are people in the congressional delegation, let's say, I don't know, let's say Ohio has 21, I don't think we have 21, but let's say we have 21 people in the House of Representatives and 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans, and then there's one race that's not decided yet because of problems with mail-in voting. And don't think that there aren't gonna be problems with mail-in voting, this is gonna be a disaster because it's going to be done on a bigger scale than it's ever been done before. Uh, so I encourage people, if you really want to make sure your vote counts, go vote in person. Just do it. Um, as difficult as it might be, uh, I think you need to do that because uh, the front page of the Columbus Dispatch this morning, what did they say? There was a recent race where there were 21,000 absentee ballots that still haven't been dealt with because of problems, that's 21,000. Remember, uh, Bush beat Gore by 537 votes, or 534 votes in Florida in, two, in 2000. So this is 21,000 uncounted. It's, I think it's just gonna be chaos. That's what I think. And so this is part of what Nancy's doing on her mything the point, she's building the narrative that the whole process is gonna be illegitimate. And you see this, I don't think I've ever <coughs> seen as many cases where the media is just engaged in outright propaganda. It's, it's shocking. And sometimes when I'm digging for a story or something, I, I really try to source things from two or three sources because I, I really do have a desire to be accurate. The, and rather than appeal to your emotions. The, believe me, the truth is appealing to your emotions as well, but it should appeal to your emotions. You should be troubled when you see these false narratives that are, that are adopted, but everybody's out there creating narratives. And I will be honest with you, I see it on both sides of the issue. I am continually sent videos by people. You need to read, you need to watch this. So this week I was sent one about Moderna, which is one of the companies, there's I think 150 companies that are trying to get a vaccine for the coronavirus. Moderna seems to be out in the lead. I think they're into the second phase of some of their trials and that sort of thing. And the the message was, you know, the, the vaccine is bad, you shouldn't take it, that sort of thing. But leading up to that was a pile of facts that were so easy to prove as untrue, it bothered me. It bothers me that Christians send that around. Now, I try really hard. I, I'm like everybody else in this day and age. 
you get something, it sounds right, and what happens is, and so this video is very critical of Gates and Fauci, and there are a lot of reasons to be critical of Gates and Fauci, but don't make things up. It doesn't help your cause at all. And it, it's really designed just to appeal to people's emotions. Uh, and so we, we all fall for it. I mean, we've all been raised on television and that type of thing. And you watch these things like uh, these Hallmark movies and everything that uh, are uh, manipulative. They're pretty easy to figure out, but they... Um, I'm just trying to think. The, I, I've noticed the one thing that I've noticed, though, is the use of music in the background of a lot of these movies where it really just, it, it does control you. It gets you into the flow. And so we need to be careful. But this, this is just, the, we're just at the tip of the iceberg here. And I also think that there are things that I'm concerned about where myths are made up even on the other side of the aisle from Nancy Pelosi, like this lady who spoke the other night at the um, Republican convention. She was pardoned or had her sentence commuted. She was in prison for drug crimes. And I'm just a grandma in prison. I'm like the only grandma in prison. And she had a very powerful, and I watched her speech. It was very pow powerful, very emotional, emotionally laden and that type of thing. So I dug into it. And I think, thank the guys at uh, Powerline Blog. They're lawyers and conservatives, but they look at these things and they said, listen, this whole thing, this lady, this was a myth. This lady was running one of the biggest cocaine dealing rings in the city of Memphis. And millions of dollars were involved, drug cartels, gangs, and all this stuff. And so for her to get up there and look at this like, I'm just a grandma. It was just, it was a myth. Now, I'm probably not going to, I don't have time to talk about it this morning. I will say that uh, I also, um, maybe if I do have time this week, I will try to do a... Um, a midweek thing. I know I promised that, but, and I very rarely deliver, but I will definitely try this week. Last week, I, somebody offered to let me do the radio, so that counted in my view. And that's the fact. That's not a myth or anything. But I was very concerned at what I saw in Vice President Trump's, uh, Vice President Pence's acceptance speech. So I'm just going to read you what he said. I was going to try to get the video and edit it, but I just didn't have time. Let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on old glory and all she represents. Let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let their courage inspire. And let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and freedom. And never forget where the spirit of the Lord is. There's always freedom. And that means that freedom always wins. I just, I do not like the, um, as one commentator said, the switching out of Jesus for the American flag in the convention speech. I do not, I do not like that. That, that concerns me. And I think that, uh, so we need to call it out when we see it on both sides. It was an appeal to emotion, wasn't it? Because I, I heard a speech, and I, at the end, I was, hey, that's a pretty good speech. But then I started going back. Uh, I, I just was concerned about the, the nature of it. And then using this, which I think was uh, very manipulative on a number of levels. Here's what happened, though, after some people left the uh, Republican convention after President Trump's acceptance speech. Here is Rand Paul and his wife, I think her name is Kelly, walking down the streets in Washington, D.C., where they are accosted. They, they literally, they have a, you know, like a, a ring of policemen around them, uh, some with bikes keeping the crowd away. And this is this is in this is in Washington D.C. One of the most, if you've been there, it's one of the most secure 
cities on the planet. Uh, he, here he helps the policeman who's been knocked down get back up. But they were interviewed, I saw them interviewed a couple times, and they were like, we're, we're afraid. We were afraid for what happened. And I, I'm concerned, some, we've already had a couple people shot and killed, I'll talk about this in some of these protests, some of these riots. They're not peaceful protests. Here's a discussion between Chris Como and Don Lemon on CNN talking about protests versus church. It's a few minutes long, it's painful, but I think you need to listen to this because this is, I think, fairly typical of, a, this is a small example of the big picture. But uh, listen, this president is the guardian of Western civilization. Did you know that? No. That's what Charlie Kirk says. I know. We may not have realized it at the time, but Trump is the bodyguard of Western civilization. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob that seeks to destroy our way of life, our neighborhoods, schools, churches, and values. President Trump was elected to defend the American way of life. Well, first of all, how can you be a bodyguard with bone spurs? But, um, what <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Um, what, feel what, bad does it for mean, Charlie Kirk. what does it mean to destroy our name? I mean, to, people I, feel are bad, to I feel bad for Charlie Kirk. What? I won. I, I feel good for him well, that, he got this, that he got this kind of platform. He's young. Um, I mean, it really speaks to what they're dealing with in that party in terms of who they can get uh, out there to give full-throated uh, you know, endorsements of what this president's about. But I feel badly for him that he believes that that's the world he lives in, that he's being kept from going to church. Why? Because of a pandemic? I want to go to church. I miss going to church. I understand there's a pandemic. You know who else does? My priest <laughs> understands it. Oh, but you can protest. One has nothing to do with the other. You are dealing with people who are responding in this country to outrageous acts of social injustice. Mm -hmm. To say, well, it's the same as going to church. No, you it isn't. You know if you well. told people they couldn't protest, if you invoked martial law about these types of situations, you would have chaos. Mm -hmm. And he knows it. So it's sad that he feels that he has to stoke this kind of animus in this country. Because the church people won't protest, so we can get on them, right? That's what he's saying. And uh, I, um, I don't watch CNN very much. I don't watch much network news um, because of this clear manip manipulation of everything. You saw it again this week. There was an example <coughs> in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. A young man, a black man, was... Uh, police were trying to bring him under, subdue him. They tasered him. He didn't respond. He fought them off. He got into the, uh, his car and started reaching for something, and he got shot seven times in the back. And he's paralyzed now, is the, is the word. And immediately what happened, and, and I saw an interview with someone who said, I was there 30 minutes after... I was there 30 minutes after the shooting, and there were people protesting with printed signs with the guy's name, Jacob Blake, on the signs. Within 30 minutes. Um, and what they did at Kenosha, this is the front page of this morning's uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, just a little bit south of Kenosha. And look at, the, look at the destruction that was wreaked on that city by the peaceful protesters. Here's an aerial view of some shops. These are people's lives that have been completely destroyed by the peaceful protest. And the thing that bothers me is that um, I don't like that the police shot the guy. I don't like that just to, on a... I don't like it when police shoot people. I'll bet most police don't like it when they shoot people. 
But I also have done some digging in. He was wanted on arrest warrant for sexual assault on a 15-year-old. Uh, he had resisted arrest in the past. And I don't know if the cops knew this when they went there, but the fact of the matter is, in almost all of these cases, you see the person resisting arrest. And the question then becomes, what is the cop supposed to do? What if he gotten in there and got a knife out of the car? And there are reports, not confirmed, that there was a knife found in the car. But well, let's say he got that knife and came after the police. What are the police supposed to do? Call social worker? And what's happening is we're, we're letting our, our streets descend into just chaos. This is the Department of Corrections in Kenosha. Here's some video taken by people. Upper left-hand corner is a car lot, used car, a used car lot. Every car was torched, every single car. And the business below, do you think that business is ever opening again in, or opening in, a, in the near future? Now, what happened was that there were, and I, again, I apologize, I, there were just too many things to get the videos this week. But this was a article in the New York Times. And I know some uh, Republican, mainly Republican lobbyists that work in the state house in Ohio, lobbying on various issues. And they said, listen, that what's going on in Kenosha and elsewhere is already bringing about a change in the polling on the presidential election. And it's not in favor of the Democrats. Because you, you don't see them condemning this almost in any fashion at all. You see, I saw an interview with Kamala Harris, who was sort of like, they're just out there, they, they're, this is a movement, and beware. Why, why are you supposed to beware if it's just peaceful protest, Kamala? Because it's not. And so this was an article in the New York Times saying, chaos in Kenosha is already swaying some voters in Wisconsin. In fact, I had another video, again, the one I couldn't edit, where Don Lemon was talking about it, and he goes, uh, we, need to, we need to calm these protesters down because it's affecting the polls. That's what Don Lemon said. He didn't say, oh, look, it's awful that these buildings are being burned and people's life's work is being destroyed in an evening by these violent protests that are taking place. His concern was, you know, it's, it's affecting the polls. That's sick. That's twisted. You know, so look, I have low expectations of unsaved people, and that's not the point that if he's morally good, you know, that's going to get him saved or anything like that. Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ will save him. But the point is that these people are influencing a lot of people. And it's, it's troublesome. Here is uh, some proposed legislation in the state of Virginia. It is uh, titled, um, they're amending the assault and battery penalty in the state of Virginia. Now this has already passed the Virginia Senate by a vote of 21 to 15. You might put that back out, Brian. Here's a little closer in view of the statutory provision. But down there, this is what the statute used to read before this proposal came up. And it said, and here what it is, if any person commits an assault and battery against another knowing or having reason to know that such person is a judge, a magistrate, law enforcement officer is defined, a correctional officer, a person directly involved in the care, treatment, or supervision of inmates, or an employee of a local regional correctional facility, um, an employee who, other individual who provides control, care, or treatment of sexually violent predators. And so the assault then, if you assaulted, tried to beat them up, or you did actually touch them, that's a battery. You had a minimum, it was a class six felony, and a minimum term of confinement for six months. 
that seems pretty reasonable. That's been the law of Virginia for a long time. And that's what it says, see, mandatory minimum term of confinement for six months. So now here comes along the new statute, and it says, you can see down there at the board, and such person is guilty of a class six felony. Now, I, I missed the, I, I got, I copied the wrong section. Anyway, what they did was, they took out the section that said a mandatory minimum of six months. And I believe they changed it from a felony to a misdemeanor. So that shows the Virginia Democrat-controlled Senate that is really supportive of law enforcement officers, judges, magistrates. You know this one person, one person in the criminal justice system that seems to be missing from this? Prosecuting attorneys. I don't think they're there. Unless they're a law enforcement officer. I'm not sure. But so now it's, there's no minimum penalty required, and it's a class one, it's a misdemeanor. And now they're going to go to the Virginia House, which, where it may or may not pass. This is a letter from the mayor of Portland, Oregon, to President Trump, dated August 28th, 2020. Dear President Trump, yet again, you said you offered to aid Portland by sending in federal enforcement to our city. It had riots now for 80 some days in a row. On behalf of the city of Portland, no thanks. We don't need your politics of division and demagoguery. Portlanders are on to you. We have already seen your reckless disregard for human life and your bumbling in response for the, the COVID pandemic. And we know you've reached the conclusion that the images of violence or vandalism are your only ticket to a re-election. Then he goes on to say this, this is, there's no place for looting, arson, or vandalism in our city. They burned the police union building again. again. The next night, or that night. This is, this is a buffoon. When you sent the feds to Portland last month, you made the situation far worse. Your offer to repeat that disaster is a cynical attempt to stoke fear and distract us from the real work of our city. What is the real work of your city? This, now, this is the way the media works. This is Sunday, this is this morning's Sunday Oregonian, the Portland, the big newspaper in Portland. And what does the headline say? clashes downtown. Do you know what happened in Portland last night? A group of Trump supporters did a car caravan through Portland, and one of the uh, Trump supporters, he had a hat on called Patriot Prayer Team, uh, which is described in all the press as, oh, that's a far-right group. Implication being, he got what he deserved. He's dead. He was shot and killed on the streets of Portland last night. Now, it's interesting. They say, well, he, sh he had bear spray, and he sprayed it at one of the protesters, so they shot him. Now go back to, and, and so I've seen a defense of him, why that is self-defense, and they shouldn't be charged at all. And I, I have a, my prediction is the Portland prosecutors won't do a thing with this. Now go to the kid in Kenosha, who's been charged with two counts of first-degree murder, and I have pictures that a police officer friend showed me that shows he, one kid's trying to hit him with a skateboard. I don't know when the skateboard became a weapon of choice, but you can be beaten to death with a skateboard. And another one pointing a pistol at him, and he shot them. He's charged with first-degree murder. Now, look, we can argue about the wisdom of him being there with a gun and all that other stuff. But look at how the media portrays this in Portland, clashes downtown. There was a man shot and killed. And, and they try to say it was, it was in the near downtown area. It was down where they're protesting, for crying out loud. My wife knows that on the way to church this morning, I was I was like, I cannot find this one article that I want to read. You know, when Jesus 
gave us directions about the end times in Matthew 24, he, he said one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to be brought before magistrates, judges, kings. You're going to be prosecuted. And we see what's happened. We, this couple in St. Louis where they you know, pointed their guns at the uh, people coming through their private street, a, a mob. Uh, by the way, do you know what the prosecutor did in that case? The prosecutor in that case, when they got the lady's gun, they went with a search warrant and seized the gun. It didn't work. So she sent a memo to the police people in charge and said, reassemble that gun so it's now a lethal weapon. And so when she is one of the writers of this article that appeared at Politico, the hypocrisy of that Soros-funded leftist is appalling. Prosecutors are not exempt from criticism, yet what's she doing running around? People are criticizing me for the judgments that I've made. And look at who wrote this. Diana Rector, Satana DeBerry, Kim Gardner, that's the St. Louis prosecutor. Kim Fox, she's the prosecutor in Chicago that, ref that um, refused to prosecute Jesse Smollett after he made up all that about being assaulted by people in mega hats. Remember that last winter? It's all, it seems like a decade ago. <laughs> and it wasn't that long ago. And then Rachel Rollins. These are all Soros-funded leftists that are getting in to destroy the system from within. And they have, they have another colleague who was raised by Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn of the Weather Underground because his parents were Weather Underground terrorists in prison. He's now the prosecutor in San Francisco. Um, and what do you see happening in San Francisco? People are fleeing. I should show you a picture. I, again, I don't have time. National Geographic, you can find it online, has pictures of New York City after the lockdown. Now, we've spent a lot of time in New York City over the years. This is, you, you wouldn't even see, you might see something like this if there was a massive snowstorm. You might see the streets that empty. I'm talking everywhere, Central Park, Washington, Washington Square, down in the village, um, Fifth Avenue. Nobody, nobody in New York City have any effect on real estate. I want to, I'm just going to read a little bit of what they say. In their uh, five black female prosecutors offer 11 ideas for how to make their profession part of the solution. Okay, so I'm going to read a few of their key points in their own words. I will try not to editorialize. We are not beholden to the police or their unions. We are beholden to the people who put their faith and trust in us every day to achieve safety and justice through measures that advance racial equity. And that means not just holding the police officers accountable, but reimagining the entire criminal legal system from police to prosecutors to judges. Okay, I can't, I can't help it. Editorial. I would reimagine a criminal legal system without you people in it. That would be a big start back to their things. Every, each level of the legal system reflects a level of inherent bias. And unless we stop trying to reform the system and instead work to transform it, we will never achieve the kind of change needed to upend a system rooted in slavery. All of that is a, a bunch of stuff that you spread on the fields for fertilizer around here in Ohio. Working from within, we have begun steps to rectify past wrongs. We are implementing policies that include declining to prosecute minor offenses, overturning wrongful convictions, refusing to take cases from officers with a history of racial bias, and expunging marijuana convictions. This is all, a, this is like out of the leftist Marxist social justice playbook. And when you put a noun and, or adjective in front of justice, you turn it away from justice, you turn it into something else. 
We're currently working within our own offices to make the system fairer and more just by instituting new policies, diversion efforts, and harm reduction practices. We have seen safety increase. In Durham, North Carolina, for instance, we instituted a pretrial release policy that keeps residents out of jail before trial, leading to a 12% decline in this county jail population. I have to go back and check my notes. But I believe that Durham, North Carolina was a a uh, case of a very serious injustice by the prosecutor there. You remember the uh, Duke rape case? I think that took place in Durham. Prosecutor was disbarred. Because the whole case was a lie. Now that I think they have a protege of that prosecutor in office. I think she's one of the authors of this article. So here are some of their things. Do not prosecute peaceful protesters. Citizens have a right to protest. I wouldn't prosecute peaceful protesters. The people who burn down buildings are not peaceful protesters. And if you think you are, you're, you're one of the, rep, you're the reprobate mind that's discussed in Romans chapter 1. Do not accept any funding from police unions. There aren't going to be anybody left in the police unions if this stuff continues. Require the review of all available evidence, including body-worn camera and other video footage, in cases that rest solely on the testimony of an officer. In other words, we don't believe anything the police have to say. Why would you be a police officer? Why, why would you go out there and put yourself between a mob and Rand Paul if, if, she's, if these people are in charge of any prosecution that might result. Th I have to tell you folks, this is really, really troubling to me. Ban no-knock warrants and re-examine our policies for issue warrants. No-knock warrants are a violation of individual rights and represent an overreach of police power. Well, one, they're always approved by a judge. So this is a slam at the judges. And the whole thing with Breonna Taylor, which was horrible, there are a lot more things that are operative there in that case called like facts that nobody seems to want to know. Why were they doing a no-knock warrant there? And there was a reason for it. And there are reasons for no-knock warrants. Hold police accountable by pursuing criminal charges against officers unlawfully using excessive force and other forms of state-sanctioned violence. Expand our police officers on declining low-level offenses to cover decisions regarding char charging and issuing warrants. By increasing our efforts to decline to prosecute certain low-level offenses, we can work to reverse the disproportionate impact the legal system has on black people and low-income communities. Solicit feedback from everyone. No. From black and brown community groups, which we were elected to serve through public virtual forums in the next two weeks. So I, I guess nobody from other races voted for them. Do you, do you know how s twisted this is? These people are making decisions can affect people's lives as the call for divestment from the criminal legal system, investment in communities, uh, and greater public accountability continue. The targets must be expanded to include all members of the legal, legal ecosystem. Lie! They don't care about other people. They care about putting in their agenda. Police officers, judges, public defenders, prison guards, clerks, prosecutors, and other public servants must also be held accountable for the injustices that our roles perpetuate in a system that evolve from the targeting and controlling of black people and be self-critical about what we can do proactively to lessen the harm. This is just incredible. So listen, this is, it's going to be very chaotic. I uh, just understand that. Um, and I, I know people sometimes accuse me of being worried and nervous or something like that. I'm really concerned about where it's going. I mean, I don't sit around every day 
um, brooding over it, but I, I'm very, very concerned where this is going. Because a lot of people are going to get hurt and killed in this process, I think, in the, next, in the coming months. That's what I think. Um, so, practice situational awareness. The company that leases our, we lease our building for our office space from downtown, they tell us when protests are coming downtown now. And there are, there, there's a list of them every week. Um, and some are conservatives, some are Marxists, some are, you know, they're, they're, they run the whole range. But I can just tell you that <laughs> down in the office twice this week in the parking garage in a four-story building was not even 10% full both times at noon, in the middle of the day, during the work week. So let's look at the Middle East here a little bit. And, well, let me, I have one quote that I want to read here. Hang on one second. As usual, uh, Melanie Phillips says this. She, now she's writing from uh, Britain. She says, the free world's craven fifth column Britain's unholy alliance over the world's most dangerous terrorist state. When Britain's Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab visited Jerusalem last week, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reportedly chewed his ear off. Small wonder, it's hard to exaggerate the perfidy, perfidy cynicism, and head in the sand cowardice currently being displayed by Britain along with France and Germany over Iran. Instead of joining forces with those trying to neutralize the growing threat from the Iranian regime, Britain and these two other key European powers are actually acting in concert with the world's twin empires of evil, Russia and China, in shoring up this terrorist rogue state. Earlier this month, the United States proposed that the UN Security Council to extend the Iranian arms embargo, which is due to expire on October 18. This was strongly supported by the Gulf states, more about that in a moment, which said that Iran has continued to supply conventional weapons to terrorists and separatists in the region and to intervene militarily in surrounding and neighboring countries. The proposal, however, went down in flames. Only the Dominican Republic voted in favor. Russia and China opposed it, while the UK, France, Germany, and other Security Council members abstained. So the sanctions that have seemed to have had some effect they're gone for now. Now that leads to some things here about the Middle East. So what happened in the Middle East this week, there were a series of meetings with Secretary of State Pompeo. All of these related to trying to extend the reach and scope of the Abraham Accord that was announced a week ago last Friday or Thursday between the United Arab Emirates and Israel. So the first stop on his um, little jaunt around the Middle East was in Jerusalem, where he met with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and they each made some comments. First, the comments of Prime Minister Netanyahu about their meeting. There are two things, uh, two great things that have happened since our last meeting. The first is that you have stood up to Iran's aggression and triggered the snapback sanctions. I want to commend you for doing so. I think people should realize that the Iran deal uh, failed just as we predicted. Uh, not only did it not uh, mollify Iran's aggression, it fueled it and increased it. And we've seen Iran, since the JCPOA was concluded, uh, emerging from its cage, its cage and devouring one country after it another targeting countries with rockets, with terrorism, uh, with uh, pillage and plunder and murder, murder, uh, all over the Middle East uh, and even beyond the Middle East, um, including into your hemisphere. And in fact, uh, to see the Security Council uh, not only not join the American snapback sanctions, but resist it or stand on the sidelines and allow uh, the, this embargo on Iranian uh, 
uh, arms shipments, uh, shipments to Iran uh, to agree to it, I think is outrageous. That means that this uh, regime will get tanks and aircraft and uh, missiles and anti-aircraft uh, defenses to uh, continue its, uh, its campaign of aggression throughout the region and the world. It's just absurd. Here's uh, Secretary of State Pompeo in his uh, brief snippet of his remarks. Uh, President Trump's made clear Iran will never have a nuclear weapon, and we are determined to use every tool that we have to ensure that they can't get access to high-end weapon systems, air defense systems, uh, the ones that the Prime Minister spoke of. Uh, we think it's in the best interest of the whole world. Many of these leaders tell me so privately. It's time to stand up. Uh, it's time to publicly account for the fact that Iran is on the cusp on October 18th of having access to those weapons and the money that will come from their sale of those weapons that will be used to inflict real harm, not only in the Middle East, but in Europe as well. And so I'm confident that we'll achieve that, and I, I welcome uh, Israeli and Gulf state support for our effort. The people most impacted by Iran having weapon systems are all in favor of this arms embargo being extended. The rest of the world should join us. Uh, we had a chance to, I wanted to come here today in part to congratulate the Prime Minister. I'll travel to the Emirates uh, to meet with them and congratulate them too. Uh, what's taking place here is deeply consistent with what President Trump set out to do, create a more stable, more prosperous Middle East. This is a really good step in that direction. Economic relationships between the Emirates, opportunities for innovation and science, travel between these two places will now be open. And that's important. That's important to create between Israel and this Arab state this opportunity. But I'm very hopeful that we will see other Arab nations join in this the opportunity for them to work alongside to recognize the state of Israel and to work alongside them will not only increase Middle East stability but improve the lives in each of the for the people of their own countries uh, as well. Uh, we've done our part in moving the embassy here by recognizing the reality of what the Golan Heights is by acknowledging uh, that uh, these settlements are not per se unlawful. These are the kinds of things that nations can do together to work to increase the security and stability for our two countries and for the region as well. Uh, it has been a great relationship. It will continue to be a great relationship, and it was an honor for me to be with you here again today, Mr. Prime Minister. So he also, while I was in Jerusalem, he met with uh, the Blue and White uh, Party, had the alternate prime minister, I think is one of his titles, and then also the foreign minister, uh, Gabriel Gabe Ashkenazi, they then went, uh, he went, and this was the reaction of some, you know, Iran and some of their allies continue to respond to this. Iran, Hamas, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad are calling for an uprising after the normalization deal. There have even been calls in some parts of the Palestinian community for the assassination of the head of the United Arab Emirates. This is a Iranian editorial cartoon giving their opinion of what the agreement between the UAE and Israel looks like. And you see that the, all the anti-Jewish hatred imagery, the Jewish soldier with the knife behind, hidden behind his back, the pool of blood, and then the UAE, of course, with the uh, Israeli flag on their forehead. Uh, I'm learning a lot by watching these editorial cartoons in the uh, Middle Eastern press. They're pretty, pretty direct. So from there, Secretary of State Pompeo went to Khartoum, Sudan, to meet with the Prime Minister there. Uh, of course, there were great hopes that uh, Sudan would sign on. And this is kind of interesting, uh, what happened. This is the Al-Akbar newspaper in Lebanon showing uh, some things about the meeting and summarizing this. But then it came out this, that uh, Sudan, well, here's what the Arab News said out of Saudi Arabia. Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok told U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo that Sudan's transitional government, they had a coup recently, they have a new government, they're trying to get things under control, get people in place that can run the government. Uh, they had a very corrupt government for a long time. He says, the transitional period in Sudan is being led by a wide alliance with a specific agenda to complete the transition, achieve peace and stability in the country, and hold free elections. 
Hamdok said that his interim government does not have a mandate beyond these tasks or to decide on normalized normalization with Israel. Now this is kind of interesting because we know in the coalition of nations that come against Israel in the last day, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Sudan is part of that coalition. So here was Pompeo trying to get Sudan on board with normalization, but it really didn't work, did it? So that's kind of an interesting fact uh, out of this whole situation. From there, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo went to Bahrain where he met with the king there. These are all autocratic kingdoms or sheikdoms and that sort of thing. And he met there uh, in, um, in Bahrain. Now Bahrain is a little island, uh, this peninsula, sort of the thumb of the Persian Gulf. That is Qatar. And then this island just to the east, to the west, is Bahrain. It's a largely Sunni, or I'm sorry, Shia population, but the leadership is Sunni. So all of these countries that Pompeo went to are run by Sunni Muslim Arabs. And that was, that's kind of a significant thing too. So from Bahrain, he went to the United uh, Arab Emirates to meet, and then he went from the United Arab Emirates to Oman uh, to meet with them. Uh, the, the leader of that country. And so it's believed that Oman and Bahrain are probably the closest to going to normalization. But Pompeo didn't really achieve anything, but they're still pushing for it. Uh, Saudi Arabia, there were reports that Saudi Arabia was supposed to have a secret meeting with Netanyahu in DC, but they canceled it because, the new, because it became a no longer secret meeting. So Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman thought that it needed to be canceled. So that's kind of an interesting factoid as well as to what's happening. Another thing that you need to continue to watch is uh, Erdogan, President Erdogan of Turkey, and what he's doing. Look, their, their economy is in shambles. They're having a lot of problems, and Erdogan is causing trouble everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, there's trouble. Now, he's not committing a lot of troops or resources to it. He just wants to cause trouble. So this is an interesting, from the Daily Sabah, this is a uh, pro-government, pro-Erdogan mouthpiece. Uh, and this is what they say about the discovery of gas in the Black Sea, which uh, this is, again, this gas oil thing in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean and the effect that it has on Russia and other things, these are all, I think, important components of what's going to eventually lead to some major conflict. So he announced they found this 320 million, billion cubic meters of natural gas in the Black Sea. It's not a huge fine, but it's enough to effectively provide all of Turkey's gas needs for the next, for 11 years, once if they didn't buy gas from anywhere, which would have a big impact on Russia because Turkey is Russia's second largest customer for natural gas. And Russia needs the revenue. They are having economic problems there. They are having unrest. One of the opposition leaders, the main opposition leader in Russia, had an unfortunate poisoning incident uh, recently. He's had to leave the country. And he's been kind of a thorn in Putin's side for 10, nine, 10 years. Uh, he started a YouTube channel, anti-government corruption investigation website, that sort of thing back in 2013. And they finally, it appears they got him. Now, of course, everybody says, oh, no, no, it was just, uh, you know, some bad quiche or something that the guy had uh, at a restaurant. But, um, so this is what the editorial says in the Daily Sabah. More interestingly, however, is that the gas that is to flow through this pipeline comes from Israel's Leviathan and Tamar natural gas fields. It's talking about, originally Turkey wanted a gas line to go across Turkey from the Israel, Israeli Leviathan field. And Turkey started supporting, they had Hamas terrorists meeting there in, with Erdogan in Ankara this week. There are pictures of that all over the internet. And Israel decided to go enter into an agreement with Greece. 
and then eventually on to Italy. So a pipeline from the Israeli fields to Cyprus to Greece on to Europe. Russia doesn't like it, Turkey doesn't like it, Turkey wanted to, you know, siphon off some tax revenue for, you know, tr transport taxes across Turkish territory, and that's been done away with. So the response has been that Turkey's been entering into all these little different agreements. They have the East Med Agreement with Libya uh, to essentially block the pipeline going from Cyprus to Greece. They also have one they've entered into with the people in Gaza that's to block this. And so th now, whether these are enforceable or not is not the point. The point is that Erdogan's gonna use everything at his disposal. This is what the Daily Sabah editorial cartoon is. This is the Greek ship of state weathering the storms that people are throwing their way. And so here's another editorial, the agreement between Turkey and Libya to block everything. Um, very interesting the way all of these things are doing. And so all of a sudden, the Eastern Mediterranean has exploded into this very volatile region, which we should not be surprised at with, as students of Bible prophecy, because this is going. We shouldn't be surprised that the Sunni Arabs are trying to get normalized agreements with Israel to help protect them against Iran, Shia Iran. Uh, foreign policy has a couple articles on this. How did the Eastern Mediterranean become the eye of a geopolitical storm? And this is entirely accurate. Um, it happened. And so this, this is a publication from the Muse uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Turkey talking about why we entered into this uh, Eastern Med agreement with Libya and everything. And it's, it's all a bunch of propaganda. Um, and then this is from foreign policy also back uh, or, or this week. Turkey's plans to become a regional energy giant just got to be. So listen, the foreign policy people are looking at all this stuff going on in the Eastern Mediterranean. And they're saying, doesn't look like Erdogan's ready to go to war with Greece right now. But there's a lot of conflict. There's ships moving around. And we know that ships sometimes collide. Things, missiles get fired. And things can quickly go from... Um, a lot of blustering to a hot war. Um, so this is uh, interesting, and this, but this gas find in the Black Sea will put some pressure on Russia's uh, gas company called Gazapron. Uh, it they have some contracts are up for for renewal this year or next year and in 2025, and this so. Turkey's going to try to negotiate a lower price. This is going to have an impact on Russia's revenues. Um, here's an article from a couple of years ago, the Trojan horse of Russian gas that, you know, this is what um, is it Russia's trying to get influence in all these countries because they provide the gas for Europe and elsewhere. This is another editorial from the Turkish newspaper about how Turkey has effectively dismantled the uh, European Union. Very good graphics. Turkey's also is ex exerting its influence into uh, northern Lebanon. Uh, there are troops and that sort of thing and relief agencies is the sa sort of the same thing that Turkey is doing in East Jerusalem and other parts of the uh, Palestinian areas of Israel and Jerusalem to uh, spread its influence. It's, it's very clever. So this is a very interesting level of war. But you should read Jonathan Spire's article uh, that there is now evidence that uh, Sunni Islamist Ankara is seeking to fill the vacuum in, in um, Lebanon. And Lebanon continues to struggle. This is a little cartoon out of the Al Akbar newspaper that everybody's trying to give um, money to the Lebanese people to help them rebuild. Macron is supposedly there today, I think, you know, sort of pushing things, but it's a trap. That's what the word is. That's what the Lebanese people are viewing it as a trap where they're going to get hammered uh, if they take this money. And here's an article from the. UAE national newspaper Macron says war could break out 
if Lebanon is abandoned. And at the same time, we also have some big Saudi projects are coming back on track. Neom, Riyadh, they're building, and Jeddah, they're building the uh, tallest building in the world. Uh, I'm told it's going to be well over 3,000 feet tall. I think the one in the United Arab Emirates that's the tallest building right now is 2,700 um, feet high. Uh, this one's going to be much higher. Some say it could go to three. There's some rumors that it might go to be a mile high, but I don't know that that's true. That would be a pretty phenomenal thing. But they're also starting to build a NEOM, this thing that MBS, Conference Mohammed bin Salman, wants to build. So a lot of very significant things going on, even though in some respects it was kind of a slow week. But uh, the one thing, the takeaway from this too, is I think that you need to be very careful about the myth building. <laughs> Mything the point means they're creating a narrative to support their points. But it's happening on both sides of this issue. As I said, I, you know, look, I'm concerned about this vaccine thing <clears throat> coming much too quickly. <clears throat> there are also a lot of technical reasons to not like it, uh, how it's made, if this one's going to be made this way and some other things. Uh, we don't know exactly yet. There are about 150 candidates out there, so I don't think you can say definitively which vaccine is coming first. It does look like Moderna is leading the race at the moment. But, and then you continue to have these increasing uh, severe lockdowns reinst reinstated all over the place. I mean, Australia, Melbourne, I guess it's, it's tyranny in a lot of respects. But you can protest, but don't you dare, don't you dare go to church. And I think a lot of this is to shape the myth, control the narrative to affect the election that's coming here in the United States. So be on your guard, be situationally aware, but stay in the word. We know that, we know that these things were coming. It's sometimes a little bit hard to wrap your head around the fact that all of a sudden you're living in the midst of a Marxist revolution. And how did that happen? I mean, the video, the, the images, like I could say, they, they took a guillotine to Jeff Bezos' house. This is Jacobian stuff. I think it's at National Review. There's an excellent article about this Jacobian thing. Uh, one other thing, I don't have any slides. I do have videos on it, but I just don't have time to edit them. Um, Sandia Labs is a big federal government contractor. There's a guy named Christopher Rufo who writes for City Journal. You can check him at, on his Twitter account. And he relates a story of Sandia. They have about 15 or 16,000 employees. They're involved in the nuclear energy aspect testing for the government. Um, a guy got on, posted on their internal servers, and it's still up on YouTube. I cannot, you can find it. Uh, if you go to Christopher Rufo's Twitter account, at least YouTube had not taken it down. He got up and he said, this social justice Marxist stuff is a bunch of nonsense and we should resist it. Um, not surprisingly, he's fired because he spoke out against it about the social justice stuff. This is happening everywhere. BioLogos an organization that I don't really care for because their view of creation, they're more of old earth creationists that claim to be evangelicals. They issued a statement signed by 2,700 evangelical leaders that said, hey, all you people, you just need to go along with what the science says and pay attention to what the government and scientists say with regard to the vaccine and that type of thing. Those are evangelical leaders. I think what's being set up is what Jesus prophesied is that your own brothers will turn on you. And I think that's what I see happening. So there's a lot of things that I didn't have time to talk about today, but listen, stay grounded in facts. Don't be persuaded by the ones who want, who are mything the point or mything the points. They're very dangerous. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for 
the guidance that you give us, that you uh, warned us about the times that we live in as we get closer to the return of Jesus to set up his kingdom. We just pray that you will uh, help us to stand strong in the faith, guided by the Spirit, always willing and able to stand for the truth, but also to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ around, with those around us. Bless us this week, in Jesus' name, amen.